right, this morning we're going to actually finish Acts 15. Uh, we're moving quite rapidly. My wife asked this morning, where were we going after Acts? I want to go back to the epistle to the Hebrews and spend some time in that marvelous book. And really, it's all about Christ. I think that the church has forgotten that everything is about Christ. And that you know, we need to be constantly reminded. And Hebrews will definitely do that. <clears throat> Last time we saw in this 15th chapter uh, that there were some false brethren. The, the Bible says they believed, but clearly um, their belief was not saving faith because Paul called them false brethren in the Galatian epistle. And uh, that these Jews uh, came into the Gentile churches and tried to subject them not just the circumcision, which was a part of the Mosaic system. Um, a, the circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God made between um, himself and Israel. And I would imagine that uh, the Jews wanted the Gentiles to prove uh, that they were part of the covenant people by subjecting them to uh, a rite which long ago had lost its meaning even to the Jews. To the place where God had told Israel many times to circumcise your heart. Not your foreskins, but your heart. That's where the issue was. And um, the issue of circumcision has to do with the heart, which is a teaching in the New Testament. I also reminded you to remember uh, that the church in Jerusalem... Um, specifically wanted people to know who were their men, who they sent. These other Jews identified themselves as part of the group, but they were never sent by James at all. James had nothing to do with them, and that's what it says that uh, uh, in uh, chapter uh, 15, verse 24, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. We didn't send them, and we didn't teach them to say this. We, we had, we have, they dismissed themselves, the Jerusalem Council, they dismissed themselves from this entire incident. They were not sent by the apostles. They were not sent by the Jerusalem Council. They identified themselves as part of the council. They identified themselves as those who could teach the new saints, the new Gentile saints, but they were neither. They never were sent by James. It says, certain went out from us having troubled you with words. They went out from us. We didn't send them, though. We gave them no such commandment. We didn't command them. And notice that we're a commandment again. We didn't command them to teach these things. This was something that they did on their own. And it was troubling, and it was subverting to the soul. It was it caused great distress among the Gentile believers. Now, I can only imagine how horrible that must have been at that particular time. And then he goes on to say, "It seemed good unto us, us of course being the council, being assembled with one accord." Notice that, in contrast to these guys that went out on their own having lied about who they were, having identified themselves as being a part of the council, James says, we didn't send them, and uh, we know nothing about what they're doing at all. This is something that they did on their own. Then he says, we're together with one accord. We're going to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. They were familiar with Barnabas and Paul already. And so the council said, we're going to send our men. Now you already know, just by way of contrast, that these Jews that went out on their own, um, they had nothing to do with the council. The council said, we know nothing about these guys. We're going to send people that we identify with, along with Barnabas and Paul, of course, whom they were familiar with. Um, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So, Judas and Silas were sent along with Paul and Barnabas to confirm the words of the council. What are the words? We didn't send these guys. 
they 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 weren't authorized by us to say these things, and said we're going to say this. This is what we want you to do. We're going to send these men to confirm what the council actually said, and Paul and Barnabas will also confirm it as well. Verse twenty-eight. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Notice that. Now again, notice something very significant here. Verse 25, and this is a constant theme of the work of the Spirit of God. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord. There's always this unity, this, this 100% unity with the work of the Spirit. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. They're in agreement with the Spirit of God. Whatever the Spirit of God determined, they're in agreement with the Spirit of God. That's a good thing. Is it not? It's a wonderful thing. That's why I said this whole idea of a democracy is bogus foolishness. The church does not get the right to vote on what God wants. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. We came together being assembled with one accord. We already seen that over and over again in the book of Acts, what that means. They were completely united in thought, word, and deed. Everything was done, was done in unison. That's why they had to tell the new converts, these Gentiles, like, look, we have nothing to do with these guys. Nothing at all. We didn't issue them any edict, any commandment, any charge to say any of this to you. Period. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. I want you to remember those little lines. Because they're very important, again, in this whole book of Acts, which apparently people either don't read, don't want to do it, or just a bunch of dunces, because it clearly unites the unity of the body of believers together, where you're talking about the church or the council as a work of the Spirit of God. They're all in unison. To lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So the Holy Ghost, of course, was in full agreement with the united church body because he united the church body. He's the one responsible for this unity. This decision was done to make sure that the Gentiles would not have any burdens placed upon them, any burdens, particularly any Jewish burdens of law, which Peter made clear that we nor our fathers were able to bear. You don't want to yoke the new believers in the system that they themselves, the, the Jews, couldn't fulfill. However, and this is key too, they were to live a life that was holy, a life that was separated from the behavior that was known among the heathen. And this is very significant as well. Because today, in today's so-called emergent church cult, and that's what it is, it's not even, it's not even salvific, you don't have to have a changed life. And frankly, I am just well sick and tired of the entire foolish notion that salvation does not produce uh, a radically new life. That is outrageous false doctrine to think that the Bible does not teach that salvation does not produce a new life. That is outrageous false doctrine. If you're the same person you were before your supposed salvation, you're not saved at all. And there's this constant call to holiness on the lives of of professing believers, of, of believers, period. Their salvation experience was to cause them to live a life of holiness that was consistent with their life in Christ. That's one of the reasons why, why they had this constant teaching. The focus was on teaching because people, these Gentiles had no knowledge of the ways of God at all. They were just heathens. That's all they knew. So they had to be trained so as to understand the mind and will of God, who God is, he's a creator, you're subjected to him, as such, that these idols that you are used to following are all false, and you're no longer subject to them, and the behavioral pattern that was a result of following your idolatry, it has to stop, that's why there was such an emphasis on teaching new converts, uh, back to verse 28 again, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye abstain from meats offered to idols that's one and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well 
fare ye well. So they were to abstain, in essence, from idolatry and all the other things associated with it. And again, this is all, if you notice, again, this is amazing how we just don't see this. How religion plays a fact in our in, in sinfulness. All this of same meats from idols, blood, strangle, fornication, all that was part of their religious culture of heathens. We don't really see the sin of our country, the sin of our country and the sins in it from the perspective of a religion. We don't see it. Atheism is a religion. Atheism, so called, is a religion. There's no such thing as an atheist, it's a God denier. It's a Romans 1 God denier. But that's a religious issue. That's a spiritual issue. We don't see the sins of our country and the sin of our country as a spiritual issue. That's why we're not addressing these things the right way. But it is in these Gentile cultures that, that uh, the Jerusalem Council was talking to, it was cultural for them to be involved in idolatry and all things associated with idolatry. And they're saying, as a believer, that stops. That ends. Verse 30, so when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude, here we go again, gathered the multitude together. What does the church do again, church? They gather, they gather together. This is so simple. They gathered together and delivered the epistle, the epistle being the letter that the church, see, now you know what an epistle is. Epistle is a letter. This isn't uh, an epistle epistle as we know it. It's just the letter that came from the Jerusalem Council with the instructions given to the Gentile believers. Now look at their response. Which, when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. Well, what's the consolation? Well, the letter that came from the Jerusalem Council brought encouragement to the Gentiles. And the men that were sent along with Paul and Barnabas brought a consolation to the Gentiles. Isn't that wonderful? It is. It's just, it's so simple, so wonderful how God used all the simple things, the powerful yet simple things to accomplish His will. And look at, look, here, here's, some, here's another, look at this, Judas and Silas, verse 32, being prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirm them. See how wonderful that is? So you have these men, Judas and Silas, who came from the Jerusalem Council. After the epistle was read, they were encouraged, and then they sp spent some time there and, and preached and taught the people. That's amazing. They urged the brethren with many words, confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. It's, it's wonderful. Simple simple. In fact, Judas and Silas did to the saints exactly what Paul and Barnabas did to the saints. The same one, strengthening and encouraging them. Notwithstanding, verse 34, it pleased Silas to abode there still. I like that. Paul also, and God has a plan for this too. There's a reason why Silas was there which will become very apparent in later chapters. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. See, here we go. Teaching and preaching, preaching and teaching, all this. It's just there. You see this great mass of teachers, this great emphasis on instruction of teaching the saints. That's that I see nothing about music. I see nothing about method. I see nothing about the junk that doesn't work. All you preachers listening to me right now, if you're not mad, the fact is, all this stuff you're using is junk. All this trying to win the people over and coddle them in their laziness is junk. It's garbage. It doesn't work. The great focus is on teaching. And if you notice, there is always a camaraderie with the teacher and with the students. You can't teach people that don't want to grow. That's common sense. You can't teach people don't want to grow. You can't teach people don't want to learn. You see an encouraged church body of new believers and an encouraged and energized leadership working in unison together to accomplish the plan of God. That's it. 
Paul also with Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Many others also what? Many others also teaching and preaching the word. Tremendous emphasis on preaching and teaching. We don't see that today. Preaching and teaching has taken the back seat to a bunch of nonsense. And I don't even want to waste time talking about it really because it's all junk. It's junk. The ends don't justify the means because the means aren't biblical. Now when Judas and Silas had the opportunity to leave, Silas decided to stay with Paul and Barnabas. And we're going to see again that that was also the will of God. Now watch this. Because even in all this, <sighs> sometimes mess happens. Some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they do. You see that? The desires of both Paul and Barnabas was right. It was for the strengthening of the churches. They wanted to see the brethren. They wanted to see how they were doing. They wanted to go to every city where they had preached the word of the Lord and see how the churches were doing. They had a great care for the saints. They didn't just, you know, do a drive-by, drive-by preaching and kept going and not have any concern. Now, if they had anything to do with the saints and their salvation, they wanted to go and see how they were. I don't, I, you know, we, I, I keep having to say the same thing over and over every week. I don't see this happening in today's churches. It's just not happening. It seems like there is this very distant mindset about how we should care for people that we allegedly were used of God to be led of the Lord. I mean, if you're in a situation where you've been used to, you know, start three, four, five, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten churches, you're responsible in some some way to go back and see how these people were or are. Instead of just drive by and keep going. No. Why don't you go and check on these saints? See how they're doing. Verse 37, And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with him, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Remember I told you to remember that point. When the Bible in Acts says that John, John left, went back to Jerusalem. Someone looks at that and they figure, well, there's nothing, nothing interesting there. Well, now you know why. Uh, this disagreement, which we'll see in a moment, was quite heated, all right, was not over doctrinal matters. That's important. But over who was the best choice to accompany them on this work. Now, I already told you about Paul. Paul wanted people he could trust. He didn't want to take no flakes, flunkies, or fools. If you can't take the heat, he ain't going to invite you near the kitchen, okay? If you can't endure, he says, I don't want nothing to do with you. I love that about Paul. Very few people ever say that about Paul, but that's, that's what he says. He says, no, he, he, didn't, he departed, he left, and he didn't go with us with the work. He wasn't ready, whatever. And Paul said no. But the issue wasn't doctrinal. The issue was who could be the best choice to accompany them to the work. And if you want to know who I agree with, I agree with Paul 100%. I believe Barnabas was wrong. And I believe Barnabas was wrong simply because Paul was a chief speaker. That should have been enough right there. Number two, Mark was related to Barnabas, and that's always a problem. Nepotism always rears his ugly head. Paul insisted that John Mark was not the best choice because he deserted them. When the Bible says he left in 1313, that means he deserted them. Paul was right. It is of interest to note that John Mark was a cousin to Barnabas according to Colossians 4.10. So beware of nepotism or favoritism towards family members. You know, let's just say 
it's, it's hard for me to say this simply because nepotism rears his ugly head regardless. But let's just say, yeah, I know he, I, I know that we're related, but uh, I still think he was the right person. He wasn't. If he if he divorced himself from the work, he's not the right person on that alone. Paul's reasons for choosing the right person had nothing to do with family, but in faithfulness to the work. Paul was interested in qualified workers. You had to be able to take the heat. And if you couldn't take the heat, Paul said, nope. I think every now and then it's always asked. I think either my wife might bring it up or I might bring it up. We both might bring it up in passing. You know, why is it that our fellowship isn't bursting at the seams with people? And there's always a simple answer to that question. That there are, I, I always have believed since the, the first day of my salvation that most folks in the church are nowhere near safe to begin with. I've always believed that. And I, I, I state that even to a greater degree now with all these different cults disguise themselves as churches. You know, and I just don't see the church filled with believers. I see folks that are lazy. They're, they're lazier because I knew lazy ones when I got saved in the, in the mid-70s. Folks today, you know, they, they got rid of evening service. They got rid of Wednesday service. And soon they're going to get rid of all services because the, the people are lazy. If you don't Skype them and Facebook them half to death, and now you have to succumb to, you know, the, the devices. If you want to have people, you have to change with the time. I'm not changing with anything. There's nothing to change. This is what the Bible says. But the fact is, I'm not someone you want to be with. I've had people tell me time and time again, this Harley Howard cat, if we're going to be there, we're going to have to get serious. That's an indictment upon you. People have told me that. You've met them. You've known them. You know, if we want to be part of that church, we have to get serious. Well, what are you doing then? If you're not serious, what are you, what are you doing or what have you been doing? They don't want part of, the, of this fellowship because they know they're not going to sit on someone who's going to be lying to them and, and playing. And though people we've in the recent past have gotten happy for a few minutes, happiness ain't, happiness is not endurance. And when that word began to start cutting into that into that flow, into that little group there, they all just oh, oh no 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 we can't have this. They just couldn't have we couldn't have, we can't have this. Of course not. You can't take the heat. You don't want someone to teach you the truth. You, you've been lying to yourself. Oh, you get happy for a minute and everything was great and wonderful. But that word will continue to cut and dig and there's no escape. People don't want the heat of the truth. Oh, they receive immediately with joy. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. They don't want the truth. The reason why this place is not bursting at the seams has nothing to do with me. Or nothing to do with the people that are here. It has everything to do with the condition of the hearts of hearers who do not want the truth. They don't want it. That's it. They don't want the heat. They talk about, oh, I wish I were... No, you don't. I think maybe one or two people really mean it. I, I really believe that a handful of people, if they were here... They would knock this door down to get here. I believe that. I believe there's a, probably about four or five people that I know on Facebook that I think are sincere. And I think of one sister right now that I want to give her name. But I believe if her and her family were here, you know who she is, she would knock the door down to be here. You know, she has written some things that I frankly am like, wow, it just knocks me out. How blessed that I am to know her. Uh, and to help her in her spiritual walk. She would be one of the few exceptions. But no one's burst into the seams around here. And and those so-called churches that used to burst, they all, I look at the pictures, I see how they fix them cameras. When they zoom out, you know, they got more pews than folk. Because of apostasy. The days are evil. People do not want the truth. They want to be entertained. But I want faithful people around me. I don't. I. You can't do anything with faithless people, except waste time with them. So, if I have a small congregation with faithful people, that'll work. And if we have a large congregation with faithful people, that'll work. 
either way, we got to do things the right way. Paul was interested in qualified workers. He didn't want anybody because anyone couldn't do the work. Verse 39, look at this. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Okay, the he being Paul. So, this is the last time you see Barnabas or Mark in the book of Acts. That's it. It's also the last time you'll see Paul and Barnabas together in Scripture. That's it. That was it. Splitsville. Was that the first church split? No. Not at all. It's not even talking about the church. Now look at those trees out there. We were just talking about a few minutes ago. They were perfectly still. And now look at that. Wow, we're just talking about the Santa Ana winds that the trees I'm looking at were absolutely straight as an arrow at 10.30. And we, me, I was mocking the weather report with my wife talking about, <laughs> you know, well, they got another half hour to go. Now them trees are going sideways. And and they'll be further. So that, that was like just a, just a little while ago. Maybe they do know something every now and then. That's weird. Yeah, thank you, Lord, because I feel a little breeze coming through the door, like, really? What is all that? I thought, wait a minute. Huh? Yeah, it's probably why you're having problems with your sinuses, because of the stuff that's be blowing. Wow. So, no, that's not the first church split. No one split but Paul and Barnabas. No one, no half the people went with Barnabas and half people went, no, none of that happened. Okay. But you notice contention. Well, there shouldn't be any contention in the church. I'm sorry. Sometimes it needs to be contention. Okay, when it comes to the truth, when it comes to this, Paul wanted the best qualified man or men to be with him. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Paul. I don't agree with Barnabas at all. Barnabas wanted his, 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 his relative to go with him and took him. That's what it says. He said he went to sail on the Cyprus. Now, let me say this. Even that was the will of God. Because the positive side in this disagreement was that now the ministry to the church is doubled. I don't think it was personal. I hope not. <laughs> I don't think it was personal. I hope not. But I, again, I go with Paul in this one. I'll, I'll tell you why as, you, as we study. Okay, so Barnabas and Mark go to Cyprus, and Paul takes Silas and goes to the various churches to minister. That's interesting, too, because Paul wanted to minister to all the churches. And Barnabas, I guess he got mad and left, just went to Cyprus. But Paul took Silas and did what he intended to do, and that is to minister to all the churches which they had preached to. Amen to Paul. Now Paul knew the work would be dangerous. He needed someone who he can count on. Someone who was dependable. And the work of the Lord demands commitment and Mark was not ready for the work. Mark was simply not ready for the work. Okay, let's let's just say that he wasn't ready for the work. You know why? Somebody tell me why. Why wasn't Mark ready for the work? Keep it simple. He wasn't immature. Well, he wasn't ready for the work. That's the reason why he wasn't ready for the work. He proved that because he departed. He left him. He abandoned Paul and Barnabas. Went home to Mama. That's why he wasn't ready for the work. It is evident that Paul's choosing of Silas was the right choice. Why? And see, Paul is brilliant. I tell you, if pastors had half the sense as Paul's sandal that would do things in his pattern, they would see stronger churches. And that is, Silas was a leader and a spokesman in the Jerusalem church. That's number one. 
Number two, he was a Roman citizen. That would be helpful on that road, dealing with the, with the Romans. Number three, he was a prophet. Number four, he spoke Greek, which would be instrumental speaking to Gentiles. And last, he was a faithful and trustworthy friend and assistant. All that was a part of this man, Silas. So Paul chose rightly. I Again, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm on Paul's side with this one. You know, you got to have the right people. Now, let's go to chapter 16. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, a son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. The, the implication there is the father wasn't saved, but the mother was. And speaking of Timothy, verse 2, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So now you have another man. This wonderful relationship between Paul and Timothy begins here. This wonderful relationship, which spanned the rest of Paul's life unto his beheading, where his last correspondence is to Timothy. He loved this young man. He loved him. It was a great love relationship between the, between Paul and Timothy. So Paul meets this young man, Timothy, for the first time. And Timothy came highly recommended by the, the brethren in Lystra and in Iconium. And this is again where the bond between the two of them began. Notice once again that Paul wanted men with him of reputation. This is, this is, oh God. Not earthly reputation, but reputation in the work. See, if I ever have somebody to be with me, they got to come with credentials. They got to come with, listen, I need to know who you know. I need to know your background. I need to know who you know in the work. Who can recommend you spiritually? I don't want anyone around me anymore. I am sick and tired of flakes and phonies and flunkies. I don't want nobody near me anymore. Listen, the last umpteen times I dealt with people and extended hands to people, all I've gotten was slapped in the face. I'm done. It's over. You have to show me who you know. And I don't mean some... some Who's who in the world? I want to know something spiritual about your life. I want to know from the people you minister to. I want to know something about you. Because you're going to have something you want to be with me. Okay? I'm done with all these flakes and phonies. I'm done with the, pe the fly-by-nights. People are getting happy for five minutes and they leave the work. I'm tired of that. You're not serious about the work? Stay away from me. I don't want to have anything to do with you other than to rebuke you soundly in the faith. In this age which we live now, you we better make sure we got the right people around us. If you timid and you scared of the church, don't bother me. If you don't have the intestinal fortitude or the guts to take a stand against evil in the church, don't bother me. I don't want to hear from you. If you don't want to take the time it takes to properly mature and teach and cause people to grow, then leave me alone. Because I don't want to be bothered with you. The work is too important, you know, to have people around you that are not dependable. And Paul's model is, I want people around me that are dependable. Paul's standard of choosing men for service and ministry was dependability and reputation. And what I should have done was see the last person I was involved in, I should have, I should have asked, uh, I should have checked to see some of the brethren did they recommend this man I will not make that mistake again ever that will never happen again I should have known better I should have asked myself I need to check and see who recommends this man not look at the work and go oh that's a great work no I should have said I need to see who recommends this man what, what can I know about him and let's see if he's a man of of good reputation. That's what I should have done. I won't make that same mistake twice. I won't make it at all. Verse 3, Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters for they knew all that his, fa his father was a Greek. <clears throat> so for Timothy to be allowed access into the temple and the temple areas where 
he needed to be with Paul, he would have to be circumcised. So the, the Jews knew that Timothy had a Greek father, and uh, they would not accept him nor hear him without circumcision. Now, of course, a note here could be made again for the caliber of men that Paul wanted to be with them. I mean, for Paul to have Timothy be with him cost him something. I mean, that's clear. I mean, the reason why we circumcise babies is obvious reasons. Because if you do it as an adult, the pain level could be quite excruciating. Thankfully, I would have mine when I was a kid, a baby. So I didn't know anything about it. But as an adult from people I talk to, it ain't, it ain't like going to get a tooth pulled. Okay? So if he wanted to be with Paul and be used of God in this ministry with Paul, it was going to cost him something. See, a lot of folks just want to hang on. They don't. It don't cost them anything. Nothing at all. There was not going to be any ease in the ministry, and oftentimes one's person's comforts had to be given up to be used of God to minister the word to the law. So the prime example is right there. Verse 4, And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for them to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now look again. Remember, the decrees and the letters, the Jerusalem Council, was the source of where all the information came from. No one's going out on their own and doing their own little things. Oh, parachurch garbage nonsense. I don't even know what that is. That's nonsense. Everyone that was anybody, when they had decrees and letters, they wanted to deliver instructions to the churches. It came from the Jerusalem church, the mother church, the home church, I should say. Okay? So all the instructions to churches came ordained of the apostles and the church elders in Jerusalem. Very clear. And the result of that was churches were established in the faith, increased in number daily. Continually. So Paul and Barnabas with Timothy delivered. Now, Timothy didn't deliver, but he was just with them, of course. Paul and Barnabas delivered the letters from the Jerusalem Council to the Gentile converts, and the result was that God blessed the church again. Notice that the Gentile churches, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the Gentile church were first established, then growing in number. And this is what's needed again. We, listen, I'm convinced today that we just don't see this because we've never applied it. We tried all these junk methods to get people to come. And all they did was come. You can get people excited to join the church, yet lost, like you can get them to join various organizations. There are people who, who joyously and f f fervently serve organizations to save fish and whales and sharks and tadpoles and, and on and on. I mean, abs abs absurd and foolish. And these people, I mean, they're out there just giving their all uh, to, to support of of this little newt fish which is keeping, you know, water from the state of California. So our state has to suffer. We can't get water because of some little creature because they're worried about the extinction of a creature. I don't see them worry about the extinction of dinosaurs or anything and it prevents them from getting whatever oil would have you. I don't it's this whole thing is just stupidity and madness. We just try all these methodologies and we get people excited to come to church because in many cases I don't have to cook lunch. You know, they, they got food there. Hey, the church is a big old babysitting factory. You know, we send our church to, sun, to kids to Sunday school. We're going to have the day of, um, am I ready for some football on the beach? We let them stay in boat services. And we're fine with that. And unfortunately, the church, unfortunately, the church is fine with it too. So we get played. And for decades, we've been doing this stuff. I've been screaming to the top of my lungs, but no one has listened. All they did was ridicule me. And while church services were packed with unsaved people, little did they know within a few years, the church would be shutting down by the thousands. So now there's no evening service. 
No Wednesday night service. No Tuesday night Bible study. It's just Sunday morning. You better get it all in because folks soon won't even have that. We don't have churches established. We don't have churches strong in the faith. All we got are members. That's all we got. A lot of these large churches right down the street here, one of the largest churches down the street here, all they have are members. Biggest group of flakes and flunkies I've ever seen and, and used to work, work there. Flakes and flunkies, compromises all. Incredible. No one cares. We don't see a strong body of men, not, a, not apostles in our sense, but a strong body of leaders that come in and help straighten up this mess, which frankly a lot of them had started, with their stupid pamphlets and booklets and nonsense. We need to have churches that are established in the faith, solid, made firm, strengthened, made strong. That's what we need. Because they were this caliber of church, their numbers grew daily. People said if you have a church that's suffering, it would diminish the size of the church. You have zero suffering. And what's happened to the numbers of churches? They are diminishing rapidly. You know why persecution is good? Because you only will get someone who's saved. The only person who wants to have anything to do with a church that's going to suffer are saved people. Their numbers continue to grow. The unsaved world does not need to see or participate in a weak, insecure church. They look at us and go, they're not doing anything any different than we are. Except we're doing it with more fun. They hate to do it. They know what you hate to go to church. They know the way you speak about your church. Yeah, we went to church the other Sunday. And you know what? I, I was ready for some football. They hear it in your voice that you're not interested in your church. I had the privilege of speaking to one of my uh, co-workers about my salvation the other day. I thought that would never happen, but it did. She kept inquiring more and more. And I kept telling her more and more. And the other, another co-worker came in. I kept talking to both of them. Thank God. Let's see what happens with that. Maybe they'll hear, maybe not. I don't know, but they know now. Our churches are weak. Because both the leaders and the followers are weak. They sacrifice nothing. Have lack of character, which is produced in trials and testings. And place little value on church life, the Christian life, and future life to come. This does not mean that these Gentile churches had no problems. What it does mean is that when they did, at least they had the proper biblical foundation necessary to deal with them and to continue to grow. Sure they had it. And they're still growing. And numbers are being added by the Lord. When you have churches whose numbers are being added by man, God will give that, that church over to, oh, you don't want my plan? Here, take your plan. He will let you grow your own work. You'll be doing all kinds of wonderful things. Have all kinds of numbers and boast about your numbers. But it'll be spiritually empty. And then sooner or later, those people will turn. Then what? You have to keep gimmicks to keep them there. Whatever you use to get them in, you have to use to keep them there. The Lord didn't bring these people in. Verse 6, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Uh, why? Why did the, the Holy Ghost forbid them to preach the word in Asia? Someone tell me. Simple. See, it's all simple. That's not where the Holy Spirit wanted them to be at that time. I don't want to... You want to just... No, you don't. That's exactly right. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Holy Ghost suffered them not. Again. Why? They wanted it at that time. Okay. And passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, there stood a man of Macedonia, and praying, or prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, watch it, 
assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Simple. Now certainly Hogos wanted him to go to Macedonia. Not to have two places. Because God has a plan. God has a plan for this mission team and it was important and it is important to be sure that the Holy Spirit is doing the leading even in the good thing. The Spirit of God may not want you to go to so-and-so right now. He may want you to stay exactly where you're at or get you ready to go here. I've already told people, look, I live my life I believe on, on a mission. I'm in this thing. Wherever God wants me to go, I go. Whatever God wants me to stay, I stay. Because I don't want to do anything that's outside of his plan. Why don't you stop? There's no, why don't choose? Why don't you mind your business? Okay? <laughs> you know, people say, well, you're rude and crass. No, I just don't want to have anything to do with you. you, you, if, you're not, if you're not spiritually minded, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I just don't want to have anything to do with you. You're not benefiting my life or the life of anybody. If you're looking at things strictly from a carnal perspective, you're not looking at things from a spiritual perspective, from a biblical perspective, you can't help anybody. And I want people around me that are spiritually minded. We can challenge each other. You can be challenged. If not, you got nothing for me. I'm not apologizing for that. I don't worry about putting fires out every five minutes in the church. That, to me, is ridiculous. Listen, the ministry of these men was not determined on these men, but by the Holy Spirit. I just wish that we would get that today. Oh, Pastor Howard, you would be great in our church. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I would not. No, I would not. We would love to have you come. No, you don't. We would love to have you come and speak. Nope, you don't. We'd love to have you come and be our associate. No, nope, you don't. Trust me, you don't. You're getting excited. You're not thinking. And I've been thinking for a long time. And I'm thinking, no, nah, they don't. They're just talking. I've seen this application so many times. I'm so tired of it. Oh, they receive the word of, and anon they receive with joy. Oh yeah, they they they'll get it for a little while. They get all joy till that word hits. Oh yeah, then you're out of favor again. And you know what I'm gonna keep doing? Exactly what I've been doing, without stopping. Until they put me in the box, I'm gonna keep on doing it. No changing, no deviation, because the work is determined by God. Not by you, not by me. These men were not operating apart from the Holy Spirit's leading, even if what they wanted to do was good, listen, and in conjunction with biblical truth. Was there anything wrong with his ministry team, Paul and Barnabas team, wanting to go here? That No. Then it was a matter of timing. It wasn't time. God has a plan for this man and his group. It doesn't involve Asia. It doesn't involve Bithynia. Right now it's Macedonia. Shh. Catch your breath. Stop hyperventilating. Because you can't figure out the plan of God. You can't figure out your own life. You certainly can't figure out the plan of God. Wow. The fact is that for a work to be all that God wants it to be, He... Not the church leaders, not the people in the pews, and not even you and me. He must be leading the work. And that's where so much of the church in our age has failed miserably. We don't want to accept it, but the evidence is there. Miserably. We don't want to face the music that much of what the church is doing is not being led by the Holy Spirit at all. It's not even halfway biblical. How could it possibly be led of the Spirit? Clearly in this passage and others, there are some works that the Holy Spirit does not want to start, let alone continue, for whatever reason, His divine, infinite mind and will decrees. And decides, if, if the Holy Spirit doesn't want to work, then I would suggest you not try to force it. There's a reason why 
you have specific works that don't move or grow in a way you think it needs to grow or move in a certain way you think it needs to move. But it's effective where it is at. It is effective where it is at. I'll let you think about that. If we today regulate the Holy Spirit to the unknown member of the Trinity, then how is it possible to be led by him, which is clearly the biblical model? The Holy Spirit would not allow them to preach the word in certain cities. He just wouldn't do it. He's dealing with Asian Bithynia for his reason. Right now it's Macedonia. Notice also that it is at this juncture that the writer of this book, who is Luke, of course, also joins the missionary team. Okay, read verse 7. Okay, he said, verse 7, After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Now, read verse 10. Verse 10 says, And after he had seen the vision immediately, we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Surely gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. If I were to believe that that was Luke joining himself to the missionary group, he's also preaching the word. I don't see why not. Okay. Therefore, loosing from Troas, verse 11, we came with a straight course to Samuel, the Samuel Thracia and the next day to Neapolis. And from there, uh, for thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. So, according to Jewish law, it took ten men to make a congregation and for a synagogue to be built. This city didn't have ten faithful men. Really? <laughs> but the women met outside of the city by the river on the Sabbath day to pray. That, that's sad. That's why the Spirit of God wanted to work there at that particular time. God allowed Paul and his team to meet these women and spoke to them the word of God. Verse 14, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of uh, Thyatira, which worship God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. This is an amazing passage on so many levels. Lydia was a seller of purple fabrics from the city of Thyatira. It's possible that she left that city to expand her trade in Philippi. She is described as a worshiper of God. Listen a God-fearer, but like Cornelius in chapter 10. She needed to be saved. Cornelius believed God. Cornelius feared God. But Cornelius needed to be saved. And this woman is exactly the same. Okay? Her heart the Lord opened so that she paid attention to the things which were spoken by Paul. Notice that. God opened her heart. God opened her heart. That's why we pray that God would touch hearts. Because there's nothing you can do unless he opens it. I, I, I have no, listen, I have no power to do anything. At all. To some, I have power to frustrate their lives. That would be about the only power I seem to possess to make people mad. <laughs> you know, that's just life. No one asks you to turn here. <laughs> they don't. There's nobody, there's no compelling, if I'm all that to you, there's no compelling reason to listen to anything I have to say. But if you come back, then it's on you, not me. Because you know what you're going to get. I don't like him, but he teaches me the truth. God opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Once again in closing, I don't know how many times I have to say it, but this is one truth. I am thankful to keep repeating, and that is salvation is a divine transaction. And God is interested in that one soul in Macedonia who he sent an entire mission team to meet that one soul. 
And that's going to grow. Remarkable. Salvation is a divine transaction. God opens the hearts to hear and believe the message of his word. No methods. All, listen, we've had 30 years of this failed experiment to see whether all this junk that we claim was from the Lord would work and is not. And we haven't yet repented and apologized publicly for the junk that we have perpetrated on the lives of so many people. Many of those people still lost. We got them believing they have a relationship with God. God have mercy on our... No, he won't. He won't. If we deceive people and lead them astray, why should he have mercy upon us? Have mercy upon those who are deceived that they may find the truth before it's too late. God opens hearts. I don't open anything. One of the great failures of modern so-called evangelism is the fact that man seems to be the initiator in salvation. It becomes his decision, his profession, and his actions, and subsequently man gets the glory. This is not biblical salvation. For those who truly understand what genuine biblical salvation is, is all about, it is revealed by the reality that supernatural activity from start to finish, in other words, man responds to the grace and forgiveness that God offers. He doesn't initiate anything. Period. Period. All we do is respond to a generous, undeserving offer of the great God and Savior. There's nothing we do. Thank God for His mercies. Lord, again, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this wonderful, clear truth. And may you be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name. God is the one he is the one who initiates everything and I mean everything we don't initiate anything he is the one who initiates everything it's his work and we should be so grateful forever grateful to God for his work Again, thank you those who are watching on the Ustream this morning or this afternoon. And uh, you come back tonight, 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, or California Time. Lord willing, we will continue in chapter 16. Is that verse 17 or 18? 15. Okay, 15. <laughs> Okay, 15. Uh, yeah, then it's 16. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Lord willing, come back tonight. We'll continue in verse 16 of chapter 16. We might finish the chapter 16 tonight as well. Moving right along. There's going to be some parts we're going to just put the brakes on. But uh, <clears throat> I'm in no hurry. Whatever the Lord wants, that's what we should want. Again, thank you for tuning in. Let others know about the program, and uh, may God bless you, and Lord willing, we'll see you again tonight. Bye-bye.